All right, listeners, before we get into this week's podcast, I just want to thank our sponsor, Airship Notebooks. They're sponsoring us for the month of March. And artists know that details matter. Whatever you're creating, the details set great art apart. So when Airship Notebooks set out to create their Alpha Sketch Notebook, they paid attention to every little thing. It's 100% recycled paper, beautifully handles pencil, marker, and even watercolor, or whatever other medium you choose. The Alpha Sketchbook's brilliant lay-flat binding is not only more comfortable and convenient, it lets you spread your creativity across the entire two-page landscape. It's all that helps artists and designers, you know, people like you, be more creative and more productive. Here's one more thing for our listeners. You can go to airshipnotebooks.com right now, enter coupon code INEBRIART, I-N-E-B-R-I-A-R-T 30, and you'll get 30% off your entire order. This offer is valid during the entire month of March. So grab it while you can. And thank you again to Airship Notebooks for sponsoring the Inebriart Podcast and all our events. Welcome back, Inebriates. This is Andy, the Inebriate Podcast. Uh, we are recording yet again at the Craft Beer Cellar on Main Street in Plymouth, uh, here for all your beer drinking, wine swilling needs. And uh, we are here today with stand-up comedian Tom Stewart. Yes, thanks for having me. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, our mutual friend AJ Haypenny sent you to the show. He did. So he did. you can hold him responsible for... Yeah, I don't any- know what I was on when I agreed to this... You want to do a podcast? Oh, yeah, sure. Monday night in the basement of a liquor store? Sure. Why not? Yeah. Just sign it's me a, up for that. This is a very nice basement. They I, actually call it a classroom. Well, I've worked in worse places than <laughs> that. Yeah. We yeah. even have like a little lounge area set up. You do. You have a little Which I motion area. to like anyone's going to hear me motion. But In case I had brought my posse with me, they'd have a place uh, to uh, hang out. It happens sometimes. We have people yeah. that bring people. Oh, you do? Yeah. Do you? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's weird. Oh, I was flying solo. Today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, how did you get... You know, let's start with the basics. How did you get into the comedy scene? Were you a class clown? Such an interesting question, huh? Well, you know, about 10 years ago, uh, I just decided, you know what comedy needs? Uh, Another single white Irish guy. (laughs) Uh, Do you talk a lot about travel, too? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, airplanes and, yeah, all that. (laughs) No, no, uh, you know, comedy's just always been in my blood. And, uh, yeah, 10 years ago... You know, it was always like a bucket list thing for me to try stand-up comedy. I've always loved it since I was a kid, listening to Eddie Murphy on cassette and, yeah. and Howie Mandel and Stephen Wright and all them. Uh, and I always wrote comedy in one way or another, radio jobs and the internet. And just there was always places for me to do something funny. Even just places I worked, I would be writing things and make everyone read them or, right. or listen to them. And And then 10 years ago, a friend of mine, she took a comedy class – my friend Kim Reese, she took a comedy class, and she's not a comedian. She just took it just for the fun of it. Yeah. And after she was done with it, she's like, Tom, you really should do this. She's like, this is all people who think and act just like you. You should be in that class, <laughs> you know? Well, did you take that as a compliment or an so, insult? I did. I took it as a compliment, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so she, she hooked me up, and uh, I went into the class. Uh, it was with a comedian named Frank O'Donnell down in uh, Rhode Island, and uh, I took an eight-week course with him. And the first time I went on stage was at Catch a Rising Star, and I didn't stop since then. I've just been doing it and doing it, and now, 10 years later, this is what I do for a living. Did, did you immediately be like, oh, this is it? Or were you like, that was horrible, i got to get up and do that again? You know, I mean, I loved it. It felt like it was something that I was meant to do, but I knew how hard it was going to be. And so I just I just made that commitment that I'm going to do this. You know? Yeah. I mean, literally, after about two years, I was like, I really want to make this work for me somehow. Like, I don't think I'll ever be big and famous, but I want to make this what I do. I want people to know me as a comedian. Even if I do something else during the day to pay my bills, I want people to know me as a comic. Yeah. So I did. I focused on writing and getting up on stages and performing and just over and over and just as much as I could, you know? Now... 
I know a lot of creative types and you know, people who've worked on comic books and comic strips and whatever. And, you know, they'll show it to, like, a couple of friends. And it's always, like, inside jokes or it's, like, one joke and then it's not funny anymore. How do you write comedy to reach a, a wide audience? Because, I mean, if you're writing inside jokes, it's going to be mm-hmm. funny to two people. You can't make a career. I uh, I don't know how I know. I just I write stuff and I just get a feeling like this could work. Yeah. I think I could make this into something funny that people will laugh at. And most of the stuff I go after it are things that are everyday life things and things that people can relate to. Yeah. You know, I like to... I like to say that I'm observing life out loud, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm just making all the things we see funnier, you know? And a lot of it comes from pain. So a lot of bits I have are breaking up with a girlfriend or losing your job or something like that, you know? Things like that. But some observational comedy in there too, you know? Whether it be, you know, people using their cell phones or how people drive or whatever, you know? And I don't know. I just always had a knack ever since I was a kid of of just writing things in a perspective that related to people and, and it was amusing you know? yeah and i mean we seem relatively the same age you know with the big comedy boom in the 80s do you think that had like you know because there was you know hbo had a ton of specials oh yeah and it was, was a big the, influence on me the vh1 yeah half hour i, mean, comedy I was hour. at i was at the record stores buying comedy albums as much as i was buying music albums you know yeah. so you know i'd be out getting the latest motley crew cd and then also picking up you know the latest uh you know adam sandler record or or howie mandel or, or all these guys one of my favorites mean? was uh bob goldthwaite's meet bob Yes, that was a I, great I had, album. I had all of them. I literally yeah. did. I had a whole suitcase full of cassette tapes of comedy albums, and 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 I knew them all by heart. Yeah, you know? like back then, I could just just like you knew the words to your favorite song. I knew all the words to a bit from George Carlin or or you know whoever. And yeah, huge influence on me. All those guys, especially the older guys, the George Carlins and the Eddie Murphys. But even going before that. Richard Pryor and, mm-hmm. and Rodney Dangerfield and people from those days too because I started looking into comedy from before yeah. I was you know in my generation so I really even got into some like older stuff like like a George Burns and and guys like that like I loved the old school stuff I loved the quick wit and the way they would use their face to tell a joke mm-hmm. and sometimes just a look on their face after a punchline would get an extra laugh you know. Yeah. I was influenced a lot by like people like Johnny Carson, David Letterman, people like that. And yeah, all, I mean Rodney Dangerfield is like the perfect example. Like half of his joke was kind of his awkward awkwardness or uncomfortable, uh, just self depreciating yeah. comedy. Yeah, he was the king of that. You know that he doesn't get any respect, and you know, and he was a character. You know, mm-hmm. and he, I like him a lot too because he was one of those guys who came on later in life. You know, yeah. he didn't make it in, he didn't even really get started until later in life and then made it big in like his 40s. You right. Know? Where other guys start out at like 17, 18, 19 years old and in their 20s, they're already becoming famous. It took him a long, long time, you know, later in life to do it. Now, so you said he's kind of a, like he had a character. Do you yeah. think all good comedians kind of have a character on stage that they kind of like switch into? Or do you think it's uh, more, or is that like. I think an, to a certain degree. Yeah. You know, obviously. Others do it more than some, you know, like someone like an Andrew Dice Clay. That's very much a character, right? You know, um, um, you know, a lot of people like that. But say you look like a, somebody like a, a, a Bill Burr, for instance, he's himself. I think, you know, I would think that's pretty accurate. I think that's yeah. just him, yeah. you know. So in some cases, he's or like a Tom Segura. He's a character, but he's still himself too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because in life, he is kind of a character, you know. Yeah. But then there are people who really go overboard and become a character. You know? Sure, like um, a Emo Phillips type. Yeah, but, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, an Emo Phillips or any of those types of people, um, and that's still just as funny too. You know, everybody's got their thing. You know, and that's I think that's good. I think every comedian should try to find just their own voice. You yeah. Know? Now, we've had comedians kind of bash on improv comedians, and I know there's always kind of oh, yeah. like that heat on like, oh, he's a prop comic. Um, <laughs> but, do you think that's just kind of people talking shit or like is there I guess I don't know I've never had any of those issues with any other comedians. I I don't have any problem with a prop comic. Go go do it if if it makes people laugh then great. Yeah. You know, that's what you're doing, but I guess some stand-up comedians are a little defensive of stand-up and 
you know, improv is defensive of improv and stuff. And, you know, to me, it's all comedy, you know? I mean, if you're using puppets and throwing your voice, that's comedy to me, too. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, it's just, I just think it's funny, like, a lot of people shit all over, like, Carrot Top. Yeah. But, yeah. like, I don't he know fills why. the room all the time. Yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> like I've, gone to, I've gone to see Carrot Top live and laughed my ass off. I've yeah. seen Jeff Dunham live. I've laughed my ass off. I think, you know, I don't know, maybe they're just jealous of the fact that they had the balls to do that. Yeah. You know how much balls it must have took for Jeff Dunham to walk into a comedy club full of stand-up comedians? And be like, this is my doll. With, a, with, his, <laughs> with his hand up the ass of some doll yeah. and go on stage. Like, that's that takes some real serious brass ones to do that, you know? And same for... You know, for Carrot Top to have walked into some some club with a box full of you know stuff that he of put junk. together in his basement. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, comedy is very subjective, and as long as people are laughing and and you're not hurting anybody, I'm I'm for it. I'm for all of it. You know, yeah. I don't have any problem with. It. I don't want to see three prop comics in a row. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. You know, for me, I like comedy that kind of challenges me a little too when I'm watching it. But you know, to, yeah, everyone should have their chance to shine. Yeah. Is there anyone? Uh like up and coming that you got your eye on that like oh this guy's gonna be you know big oh or... I don't know if anybody comes to mind right now I don't I wish I watched more comedy that like I guess because I do comedy so much that I know everybody now you yeah know? so the guys who are coming up who some people may not say they're coming like a Mark Norman or a Joe List people like that those guys are really funny and they're just now starting to get their comedy centrals you know and they're starting to get their little specials and stuff um well netflix seems to be the place now netflix is rolling out a lot of comedians yeah. now. um and some of them i don't know if i feel like they're ready sometimes i watch some of those specials and i'm like Ooh, that person will, yeah wasn't really maybe they had five minutes and they tried to stretch 20 you know um i was watching one the other day i wish i could remember who it was now and it was funny, and then it got like kind of depressing. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I can't remember who it was now. And I, because I, my son's a big uh, fan of stand up comedy, and like I'm like, hey, have you watched this? He's like, yeah, I kind of shut it off. And yeah, but it, I kind of respect it because he was trying to do something different. Mm-hmm. It just, I missed me entirely. Yeah. Well, you know that's going to happen, and you yeah. know maybe that comic has you know his or her own fans and everything too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I find myself not watching newer comics as much anymore, and I probably should, but I don't know. I mean, I don't find a lot of time to just sit down and watch a comedy special anymore. I mean, I get excited over a few, you know, if, if Joe Rogan or Bill Burr or, or Chappelle or somebody like that has one, you know, I, I definitely make time to watch them, you know, Seinfeld, and, you know, I guess I still cling to some of the older guys, too, yeah. you know. And, uh, who was it? Had a really... Um uh, Ray Romano had one not oh, too long yeah. ago. That one, was, and I loved that. Yeah, it was yeah. so great. I like seeing the old time comedians who ended up becoming actors or TV stars or movie stars go back and do it again. Even yeah. when Ellen DeGeneres did it, oh, hers was. Fantastic. I thought it was. It was I was so impressed. Good. I didn't yeah. think the whole special was great, but I oh, was impressed I really that, with yeah. with her. She went right back to her quick wittedness and yeah. her sneaky stuff. And and I tried to put myself as a comedian in her shoes, like, all right, you're a billionaire now. You're as famous as can be. You know, she's basically like the next Oprah now. Yeah. You know? And that was and, essentially the whole premise of the whole thing. Everyone, was like, oh, I'm not relatable. Yeah, I was everyone talking knows to my, everything yeah, about yeah. her, so where's she going to go with that? And I was like, that's where she went with it. She went exactly with that. Like, yeah. she just found the irony in that. I think she's brilliant. You know? I think she's so funny. She's really, really smart. She's, yeah. you know, she's our modern day Oprah or Carson or whatever you want to say. You know, I mean, you know, she's daytime, but I mean, she kills it. I mean, everything she does is a viral moment on the internet now. Yeah. You know? Um, but her special, I thought, was really good. Like, I was impressed. I thought of, a little bit of it was fluff. Yeah. And I thought a little bit of it was, all right, her fans want this. They want this, like, you know, silliness here. Mm-hmm. But I thought she had, like, a good crisp, like, 15, 20 minutes that were, like, club solid to me. Yeah. Anyways, you know, not that I'm the expert. But I was impressed by it. She made me laugh, so that's all that matters to me, you know. Yeah. And the Ray Romano one, I thought, was really, really good. He was such a good stand-up. And I love the way that he broke it down. I'm like, I'm going to go back to two clubs that I used to do yeah. and, and you know yep. go from one right to the other. Yeah, like, I it just wasn't even just it. that he yeah. went back to an old club. He went back to what New York comedians do is they do a set, they run out the door, they go down the road, they jump on another stage at another club and do another set. Yeah. And a lot of comedians like him back when they were starting out, they were bouncing around three, four, five, six clubs a night in the city. And I thought that really brought out like that feeling of 
of what it must have been like back then. Yeah. You know? And uh, and he's just so funny. He's yeah. So he's so uncomfortable, and that I guess it's his character is right, being right. the uncomfortable guy in the room. You know. Uh, he was so funny back in the day, and it was like boom! It was like he was just riding a bike. He was right back to it again. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that one was a really a good one. Do you? Um, I mean, it, it, dude, does every stand-up comedian shoot for like a Netflix special? Like, is that the dream now? Or I suppose. I don't think I would turn it down if someone wanted <laughs> me one. But I'm not at a situation in my life where I feel like I'm who they're looking for. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, so I don't. I don't like harbor any of those kinds of like goals my goals is just to keep working and keep people you know, keep making people laugh and keep getting paid to do it mm-hmm. you know um so you know who knows i mean i'm not a road comic or anything i'm just a regional comic i perform around new england and you know i know some bookers who will book me and some who won't and some headliners who will ask me to open for them and some who won't and you know and they all come and go too yeah you know what i mean um so you know i mean i've, I've gone and done some festivals here and there Los Angeles, Burbank, uh, Palm Springs, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I don't think, you know, you never know. But I don't think I'm going to be the, the next guy you see on Netflix. They're, yeah. not, they're not coming to my neck of the woods scouting for comedians, really. <laughs> and, and when comedians talk, they always talk about, like, their act in, in minutes. Yeah. You know, it's 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 20 minutes. Yeah. That's how you get booked. Is, yeah. Hey, can you can you do ten minutes on this show? Hey, have you got thirty minutes? Solid, you know, stuff like that. That's how. That's that's the language of the so industry. So do you for take reason. like a ten minute bit and try to make it a thirty minute bit, or take a thirty minute bit and try to squeeze it into ten minutes? Um, when what? I f- first started writing for the first probably three or four years, a lot of my gigs were, "Hey, we need you to do ten. Hey, we need you to do 15. So I literally started writing my bits and timing them out so that they'd be in like chunks of five or ten. Yeah. So that I could just kind of like like dominoes move them in and out if I wanted to. You know, it's like oh they need they need a clean fifteen. All right, I'll do this bit, this bit, and this bit. Mm-hmm. And and I knew what ones I would do. And I guess for the most part that works now. But I don't um, I don't normally get too many time restrictions anymore. The most of the jokes I'm telling now I've been telling for a while, and so I know. Yeah, I'm usually getting booked for the 25 or 30, you know, right. and so I'm usually good to go. I usually know what I'm going to do off the top of my head. But it is a good idea to do that because, especially when you're starting out, bookers hate when you go long. Yeah. And hate if you go too short, you know. And you never know what's going to happen when you're on stage. You could get a huge applause break that'll take 60 seconds, and now you're going to go over – because you want to squeeze in that extra punchline at the end right. and finish strong, and then you went over and you pissed off the booker. So it's like you've got to hide, kind of have a little bit of a, a sense of direction, too. you know, And that just comes with practice, just doing it for a while. And so did, when you were starting off doing that practice, was it just open mics? Did you, or did you just kind of like walk and be like... Open mics. Yeah, book a little me. bit of open mics for me. I mean, that's the best place to go to work on your timing. But for me, I just, I've never liked open mics much. I just I don't get a feeling of of how things are working at an open mic. The the one thing that I've heard about them, I don't I've never been to a comedic open mic. I've been to, you know, ones that are predominantly or, music. Yeah. Um, but is it tends to be comedians who are sitting there waiting for their turn. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, most open mics are going to be comedians sitting around working on their jokes or if they've already gone up and they're hanging around then they're they're talking and not paying attention during your set. Uh, you might get lucky and there's three or four people in the bar sitting there drinking and maybe they pay attention. Yeah. Most times they don't care. So uh, for me, I don't I don't find an open mic to be constructive for me when I'm trying to build a joke. But it is a good place for a newer comic, I think, to learn how to be comfortable on stage, to, to know what to do with the microphone, with the stool, with, with the next comedian or, or what to do when the room's not paying attention. Yeah. And just get your timing down on jokes. Um, because it's all about repetition. But I, I always found one of the things I did early on was I started booking my own room. And every two weeks I had a show. And I would book some local comedians who were more experienced than me to be on the show. Oh, so you kind of like run the, the show. And it was my show. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, you know, I found a local bar, a cool place, had its own stage and everything that they gave me a budget. And every other Thursday I would book two or three comedians that I knew from the area. And I would open the show and yeah. do as much time as I wanted. And I didn't have any restrictions because it was my show. Right. So I could try new stuff if I wanted. I could mix in some old stuff or do whatever I wanted to do. And that was a great way for me to learn was from doing that. 
How yeah. how much do you, you like you said you kind of pick and choose and move around the the jokes like how much of that do you do to kind of cater to the room like do you ever kind of like start on one bit and go well I'm clearly not telling that other joke <laughs> yeah sometimes this one, like died sometimes you just get a crowd and you're like all right this crowd is not going to be into the edgy dirty filthy stuff yeah so it's like all right I may have to go in a different direction or I may have to censor some of these jokes a little bit um, not a lot uh, for me my stuff's not all that dirty it's adult but it's not filthy dirty or anything like that yeah. but i do talk about some adult stuff and these days comedy's just getting sensitive more and more crowds are getting sensitive it, it's it's a it's, it's a weird annoying. time yeah it's yeah. annoying because i've got two or three jokes that i've been doing for quite a while now five or six years and they've always been great they've always killed and now all of a sudden i'm seeing crowds going mm, eh, mm, i don't know about that and it's yeah. just because of the words i'm using yeah i do a, a joke where i say the word lesbian and people are tightening up yeah and it's like why what's the big deal like i'm not making fun of them you know right um and, and some comedians have a just a really amazing way of dealing with that like bill we talked about bill burr and mm-hmm somehow he like says crazy shit in the show and he'll just be like yeah it's a joke what do you want and yeah, like everyone Bill goes Burr okay <laughs> is one of those he just doesn't one of those comedians doesn't care yeah he's one of those comedians not even that he doesn't care he's actually very brilliant but he's really really good at finding the rough edge of everything yeah and then justifying it to a point where you sit there and go he, he's he's kind of right yeah you know like he'll he'll come out on stage and be like being a single mom is not the hardest job in the world. And right. most and, people be like, what is he saying? And, and I feel like he does that to kind of, A, get it's the a little audience bit of a off shock. guard. Yeah, yeah. It, you know. But he always has something to back it up with. Yeah. You know? And uh, and it's it's just brilliant, you know? But again, that's another situation where it takes balls to do yeah. that. You Tom know? Segura is much the same way. I love Tom Segura. Yeah. yeah. And he's, he's a lot the same way, too. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's like you really, I mean... No matter what comedy you're doing, you kind of have to not care, you know, right. not not give a fuck. You do, you still do, but you kind of have to be able to shake it off easily if it doesn't work. You it, know? And it's one of those things, you know. It's like that old uh, statement. I think some someone made it about pornography. Be like, I can't explain it, but I know it when I see it. And it's mm-hmm. like it's hard to say where the line is, but it's clear when you crossed it. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yep. But you know what? Funny is funny, and that's really the only rule is just if it's funny, it's going to be funny. Yeah. You know, if people are going to be offended, then they probably weren't going to like any of your jokes anyways. You know what I mean? And not every comedian's for everybody. No. Know? Yeah. Comedy's very subjective. Yeah. You know? So, you know, you're not always going to make every crowd happy. And sometimes it's not your fault. I, I did a show over the weekend where it was a dinner comedy show, and the show was supposed to start at 830. At 930, they were still finishing up the dinner. These people were so tired. Yeah. Like they'd been there since, I think, cocktail hour started at 5.30, and the dinner ran late, and everything ran late, and these people were just tired. Like, they'd been there too long. Yeah. You know? And now they got a belly full of prime rib. You know? Yeah. They've had a few cocktails, and it was like a country club crowd, too, so they're a little bit older, you know? And so... Yeah, some of my jokes fell flat, and I was just like, oh, this is just a sleepy room. And it yeah. was the same for all the comedians. It was just, you know, sometimes you just get a crowd that's just not into it. What's you know? like, uh, I mean, every comedian has that horrible crowd. Like, is there one that stands uh, out? That... I'm trying to think if I had one that was really, really bad. I can't think of any really. I, I mean, I know I, we get these questions all the time and should have a prepared answer. I can't say that I've ever had a really, really terrible crowd. I mean, there's been plenty of bar shows i've done where people just didn't care yeah especially if you're doing comedy this is my new rule now is if someone says oh do you want to come do a set uh you can go on in between the bands i'm like no oh I will there never should never it. be comedy and bands together. no like, i feel like I'm... people listen to bands and they can still talk and they can still yeah. do what they want to do but during comedy they need to shut up and they're not going to I, I n- and I that's never... always the worst crowds I Always never understood the the, like the band that goes on tour and doesn't have an opening band has like a comedian. That's not so bad because oh, I've never seen that work well. Uh, well, yeah, it doesn't work well. It depends on the type of band yeah. and the type of comedian, you know. Like uh like for instance like a, a Craig Gass, comedian Craig Gass, he opens up for lots of rock bands. He'll go and open up for Pearl Jam or or Alice in Chains and stuff like that, but he doesn't act 
that the crowd ends up liking him by the end of it. Yeah. You know, because he comes out and does impressions of Sam Kennison or does impressions of, of Gene Simmons and does jokes and stuff that's related to oh, that okay. type of crowd. All right, so that makes if, a little more sense. So if, you, if that's the type of crowd, it will mix well, you yeah. know? So, you know, but I don't know how they did it back in the old days where someone like Richard Pryor would be opening up for, you know, um, <laughs> uh, you know some R&B singer or something, yeah. you know, like... Uh, yeah, I just don't. Sometimes I don't know, but I—I I mean, I've seen it before, and I've been offered some of those gigs too. I've had like you know, Cape Cod Melody Ten ask me if I want to open for Eddie Money or yeah. or something like that. But yeah, I think it's best to keep comedy and music separate, mm-hmm. especially if it's a bar show. If 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 it's a a theater show, and the comedy is the first thing going up, it might work okay. Yeah, <laughs> but if they play music and then you do comedy, it never works. It never works. It's the worst. Yeah, it's just it's such a weird concept. It's the worst. Um, so you said your your jokes are a lot about like observing life and mostly. Now you're a full time comedian. So yeah. Is there like some sort? I don't want to say disconnect, but is it harder now because you know like you could before you could do like oh my day job this my day <laughs> you know this, working in an uh, office is like this no because I'm still you know. I'm not going to a nine to five job or anything anymore. I'm not, uh, and I've had a lot of strange jobs. So I still talk about all the old jobs that I've had yeah. because they're all interesting. I've worked in radio. I've worked in strip clubs. I've worked in retail. Strip clubs. I can't imagine. Uh, there's a lot of jokes that come out of that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, surprising. I do a couple. Yeah. But most of them just never worked. Really. And I, and I think the psychology behind the strip club related stuff was that. Um, most people in the audience are guy and girl ratio, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, something like that. And so the guy's not going to laugh because the guy doesn't want to laugh. Yeah. Because she's sitting there, you know, honey, I've never been to a strip club. I don't know what he's talking about. Most of the women probably haven't been to a strip club and they probably don't even understand what it's all about. Yeah. You know, they've only, you know, seen what they see on TV and not the real. So most of them didn't work. So I had to kind of do some just, um, jokes, that would kind of general that people would laugh at. And so I, I, I whittled it down. I used to have like seven or eight jokes and I whittled it down to like three good ones. Yeah. And, um, and they worked out. Is there a past job that's like really rich with comedic material? Um, like if I was going to be a comedian and I wanted to work a job that was going to be like, give me a lot of good jokes. I think all jobs really do. I think yeah. any job you work, you can find the comedy in it. You know, I mean, I've had jokes about working in the mall. I've had jokes about, you know, working in different all different places, and no, I think I don't think there's one place that stands out more than the other. I think if you work someplace long enough, you're gonna know what the funny is there, right? And the trick as a comedian is to get other people to understand it and relate it to what their job might be like. Yeah, you know, something like that, or relate it to something topical. You know, you could work at a grocery store or a restaurant or anything. There's this funny everywhere you look. Yeah, yeah, no matter what job you do. Restaurants are, I feel like, a pretty. I feel like good. there's yeah. got to be a ton of stuff there, yeah. you know, just the customers alone. I mean, it, it, these days, I think Uber drivers would have, like, tons of material. I've actually seen, know? like, um, some Uber drivers, like, making their Uber driving into, like, YouTube channels now. Sure, I'll bet, yeah. And it's kind of that old... Uh, kind of a reality type thing. Yeah, and there used mm-hmm. to be, like, I remember there used to be a show, I want to say it was, like, HBO or Cinemax. That, oh, there was the, uh, yeah. was it Taxi Cab Confessional, that yeah, one? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. it's kind of like yeah. that, yeah. Um, yeah, it all comes full circle like that. I don't know if they can legally do that, but <laughs> well, they were. Um, uh, you know, but I'm sure there's, yeah. you know, there's plenty of newer jobs. There's probably jokes you can make about podcasting. <laughs> no, we're not. Funny. You know, <laughs> maybe not yet. Yeah, um, but there's plenty. Um, and I'll tell you the strangest place because that's that'll be your next question. Is the strangest show I've ever done. So that's sure. always that always goes along with those typical yeah, yeah. questions you ask a comedian. Uh, I worked at a nudist colony for a show one time. Okay. I have other questions. <laughs> I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Yeah. One of them will be, did I perform naked? Yeah, obviously. Uh, no, I did not, but I did have the option if I wanted to. Okay. All right. Uh, all three comedians on that show chose to stay clothed, um, but one of them did eventually work up the nerve to go into the hot tub naked with some of the people from the nudist colony, but I, yeah. I'm, I'm just way too I, I feel like, shy for that. I feel like being a comedian <clears throat> naked on stage in front of two other comedians it's just i don't think i could do it you're just i couldn't do it i can't even walk around my house naked so yeah (laughs) i'm not going on stage naked i won't even you know yeah no uh but it was definitely an experience to be on a stage performing in front of an audience full of completely naked people 
So it's like that old thing where they're like, oh, if you're in front of public speaking, yeah. imagine everyone Picture naked. Picture them naked, yeah. yeah. No, don't do that because <laughs> I've seen it and it's not going to help you at all. <laughs> uh, and the weird part of it, this place was is it was outdoors and uh, we were like under this big like gazebo area and most of the people were sitting on uh, wooden benches or picnic table okay. type things. Which I'm like, first of all, that's got to be a splinter yeah. issue. Yeah, there. right? That, <laughs> okay? that was my immediate thought. Uh, the other people brought their own chairs, but they were like, uh, they were like beach chairs, like those low to the ground beach chairs. Yeah, okay. So most of them were sitting with like their legs stretched way out to oh, the sides. Oh, man. And just everything's just right there. And that's, <laughs> that was the front row. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, man. And <laughs> what was really funny was a lot of the men, um, only walked around naked from the waist down for some reason. Really? They were like Donald Duck. They just walked around with no <laughs> pants on. That's really And I don't strange. know why that was. And I'm like, first of all, I don't want to see any of you naked. But if I had to choose a half, the top it half. would be the top yeah. half. Yeah. And then some of the women would wear like something that covered them, but it would be absolutely see-through. You know, it would be like some sort of like a lacy thing or a see-through thing. And I'm like, why bother at right. this point? That's, you know? so, that's very weird. Like, uh, it was the you... strangest thing. Wow. I remember when the booker called me to do it, and he's like, uh, hey, do you, uh, you available such and such a date? And I'm like, yeah, what do you got? He's like, well, he's like, uh, it's a nudist colony. And I was like, oh. And I was like, do I have to be nude? <laughs> he's like, no, See, you that's don't. that's the obvious first question. And I'm like, all right, then yeah. I'll do it. I was like, because if I ever end up on The Tonight Show, I want to have a story to tell. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my story, the nudist colony story. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a pretty good yeah, one. So if yeah. Jimmy Fallon ever wants me to come on the show and tell that story. He's probably worked the same gig <laughs> before in the past. Yeah, uh, that's that's wow, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, some of the fun times. Um, so you said you've worked in radio. I did, did right, you, right here in Plymouth, actually, for a little while. Uh, ninety nine point nine, ninety nine point one. Nine, uh, yeah. WPLM. I did the morning show up there for a few years. Oh, nice. Yeah, and uh, I left there a little over a year ago. And uh, but I, I worked. Radio was what I really wanted to get into when I was a kid. I went right to college, right to mass communications right into radio from college and worked radio on and off for the better part of 25 years. Yeah. All over New England, Boston, Cape Cod, you know, Connecticut, Providence, everywhere. Um, and yeah, the Plymouth job was the last job I had and I, I think I'm, I've done enough of it. Yeah. I don't know. If someone comes around and says, hey, you want another morning show? And eh, I don't know if you're going to pay me maybe. But uh, right now I just like being my own boss and doing comedy and uh, I do, I run a, a franchise called Funny for Funds now where oh, I get to... Funny for Funds is um, it's a fundraising company where we use stand-up comedy and help people raise money for whatever their cause is with the stand-up comedy show. You yeah. know, they sell tickets and do raffles and things like that. It might be a youth sports league or a PTO or something. And um, it was started by uh, two comedy friends of mine, uh, Mike Murray and Bill Simus, like five and a half years ago. Mm-hmm. They started it just a small thing, you know, maybe one show a week or something, you know, back in the day down in Rhode Island. And it just kept building more and more shows, more and more shows, more and more shows to the point where they were doing six shows a night, you know. And, oh, wow. and, and I was right there from being trying to help them out and trying to keep, you know, run shows for them and do social media and make flyers and da da da. And now it's blown up to a thing where they've actually franchised it out. And oh. So because I was there with them from the beginning, yeah. uh, they were like, hey, why don't you just have your own franchise yeah. and go do what we've been doing all these years somewhere else? So I took the whole south coast of Mass as my regional area, and um, that's what I do now. So I book fundraisers and stand-up comedy, and then in between those shows, I'll go off and do you know shows just for myself and other places. So if know? I was raising money, I'd contact you, and then you'd, Absolutely. And you'd yeah. come up and with the... And we, the... we would book a show, yeah. and I would show you all the different ways that you can make money at that show through fundraising ways and we would help you with the ticketing and the flyers and the promotion and we give you all our tips and suggestions and we've got this really like state-of-the-art website that handles all the business end of it for you so at the end of the show we end up sending you a check for the money you raised you know and um and it's such a great thing because everybody's done a fundraiser where they've done the car wash or they've sold candy bars or they've stood outside the stop and shop or whatever they have to do you know maybe you've done a spaghetti dinner or something my son sold mattresses mattresses Which, oh i've heard that like yeah, high schools do like a mattress crazy. sale or something and yeah yeah i'm like what the hell the, like, a comedy show yeah. is the best thing to do for a fundraiser because the people who are supporting you they're getting something actually really good in exchange for the donation they're making right they're getting a night of laughs you know what i mean mm-hmm. and it's a fun time and they end up leaving having such a good night 
and it's something that they remember. Right. You know, and, and it, a lot of our shows end up becoming annual shows every year because everybody talks about it and they want to come next year. Yeah, and I'm sure you know? they have that. You know, they ha- they had laughs, so they're in a good mood, and they yep. did something positive. Yeah, so and it's, that, an, it's yeah. an adult night out. You yeah. know, they had a few drinks. You know, and they had a few laughs, and it's like you know, hey, we donated almost a hundred dollars tonight to this cause, but we don't care because we had a good time. You right. Know? Yeah. Where most of these other fundraisers, you go to them and you're just doing it because oh, I got to do it. Right. You know, I got to go to this spaghetti dinner. I got to go. You know, or uh, I really don't want those kids touching my car, but I got to go do the car wash, you know. Yeah. So this is just a fun way to do things. And so we've got franchises all over New England now doing it. And so people and even further than that, we've got New York, South Carolina, Florida. We've got oh, franchises wow. everywhere now. Um, but pretty much all of New England is more or less covered. And funnyforfuns.com, you go to the website and it's real easy to and just, just reach out that way. And yeah. And then we get in touch with you and we consult with you the whole way. And uh, it's a great way to, to raise money and. It's a great way to keep comedians busy. Yeah. That's the other cool thing about Funny for Funds is that we do literally like hundreds of shows a year locally. Yeah. And we need three comedians on each one of those shows. So I would say there's probably anywhere from like six to eight hundred extra gigs every year for local comedians just because just of what that. we do. Oh, that's awesome. You know, because yeah. it's so hard to get into comedy clubs and right. stuff, you know. Like, you take a comedy club and you figure, all right, they book mostly Friday and Saturday night. Mm -hmm. So you got, you know, with holidays and weather and stuff, maybe they're booking, you know, 48 weekends a year. Yep. And they're going to have three comedians on each show. That's not a lot of spots to fill. And they've got a lot of their regulars who come in once or twice a year. So those spots are already filled. So there's really only like a handful of spots to break in at some of these comedy clubs. So it's really hard for comedians to find actual stage time that's paid, you know. So Funny for Funds pays all their comedians, and we we make it look and sound and feel like an actual comedy club when we do these fundraisers. So it's a great way for comedians to get work, you know? I mean, it's not to say that we hire open micers or people right. who aren't ready, but there are a lot of great comedians in the New England area, you know, from hosts to features and headliners. And so, you know, we put them on those shows, and we try to cater the shows to the crowd that's going to be there, you know, because we're doing a church show. We'll get a clean, you know, set of comics. If it's adult show, anything goes, we'll get some of the dirtier comics on that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's all I do now, and it's so much fun. It's a lot of work, but yeah. um, that it's, sounds it's really, great. Yeah, it's that fun. sounds fascinating. And I get to be my own boss, which is the greatest gift in the world. Yeah. You know? Not yeah. for everybody. Yeah, not for everybody. <laughs> you know. But it also gives me free time to do all these other things that I wanted to do that I didn't yeah. have time to do when I was working for someone else and making them rich. You right, know right, what I mean? right. Like now I have time to do my own podcast and I have time to do – Do you, you have know, a podcast? To, I do. It's not – an interview podcast or a comedy podcast. It's actually a paranormal podcast. Oh, okay. So that would yeah. take us down a whole other avenue yeah. on this podcast. So but, um, strictly ghosts or cryptids? <clears throat> and We're huge uh, nerds and like, all of it. our podcasts all of it. go everywhere. Oh, yeah. You so. guys are nerdy about that? Yeah. Well, it's called My Paranormal Story. Okay. And every uh, – I try to do every week. It doesn't always work. But um, they're all personal stories of paranormal things that I've experienced. Yeah. And it's usually only about 15 to 20 minutes long. And it's just me describing everything – that happened that day a lot of it will be ghost or spirit related but there are a couple of ufo ones there's a couple of um you know dreams coming true type of paranormal esp type stuff all those different types of things and um i'm a big i'm a big paranormal buff too but i've also had many many experiences throughout my life and it, it actually led to me being a paranormal investigator for a while Oh, okay and with um capers no with rise up paranormal okay and uh had lots and lots of interesting experiences in doing that. So some episodes I'll talk about one of the investigations we did yeah, and provide some of the evidence that we collected, EVPs, videos, whatever, pictures. Um, and then sometimes I'll do a story where it's just a personal story of something that happened to me. Like for a while I lived in a haunted house in Providence and I had lots of different experiences there. And uh, yeah, and that's just been fun to do. I just do it out of my house. I don't interview anybody, so I don't have to book things. Right, I don't right. Have so to you do, just do it. Whenever. I just kind of do it at my own pace, yep. and um, and just release episodes when I'm ready to release them. And uh, and that was something I'd wanted to do for a while, and just I just never had time because even though they're my stories, I still had to kind of write them, right. Script them, yeah. And I try to put it together really well, so it's edited. It's got scoring. Mm-hmm. You know, it's got some production value to it. You know, I put my radio experience into it. Right, right. And um, and, I, and it's actually taken off really well now. I'm getting lots of emails from people who listen, and I'm getting hundreds of downloads every day. And oh, wow. Nice. Yeah, it's really taken off, which is cool, and, and I've kept it ad-free, 
but I've been asking people to to donate a couple dollars if they can. To like a Patreon just, or just, whatever? Just a, yeah. I even skipped the Patreon. I just said, just go to my website and click the donate button, and it goes right to PayPal. Yeah. And, you know, I get five or six people a month who donate five, ten bucks each. Some people right. do it recurring. And it's enough to pay for the podcast. So I'm not getting rich off it or anything. I'm not making any money, but it pays for itself, and uh, and I have fun. I just got a great email the other day where a woman wrote in, and she said that she listens with her two kids every week. And it's I was it's like, so cool. Wow. Like we, we've just kind of started to get some like feedback from some yeah. of the podcasts. But you know what? So when cool. All this time I've been doing it, like because I'm doing it over a year now. I'm in the 30s now for episodes, and all I was picturing was like my friends listening. Yeah. yeah I never yeah. pictured – strangers or strangers and their kids listening too you yeah. know um but it's kind of cool that they are and i always tried to keep it you know clean and and short and you know because i know everyone's attention span is short these days and um yeah so it's fun it's just something i like to do on the side i don't i don't do the paranormal investigation anymore although mm-hmm. i still talk to those guys a lot and i'm right. still very interested in it i just don't have time for it yeah and it's just become such a fad that it's really not the thing like, I took it real serious, and when yeah. it just became such a fad that everybody had a, a group, I was just like, I'm, I'm done. I got to get out, yeah. you know? But so this is how I kind of keep in it is I do the podcast, and I'm hoping to turn it into a book or two or something oh, like that's that, cool. you know? Yeah. yeah, and have fun with it. But it's funny because I'm a comedian, <laughs> and I do paranormal. People are always like, oh, you, do you tell jokes about ghosts? <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> I don't. But if there's a paranormal expo who would like to book me to do that, Sure. If you pay me <laughs> enough money, I'll write ghost jokes. I don't care. Um, well, Tom, where else can people go online to uh, <clears throat> find your comedy stuff? Well, uh, my website for comedy is TomStewartComedy.com, you know, or you can just look for me on Facebook. Um, and uh, Funny for Funds is FunnyForFunds.com, the number four. And uh, MyParanormalStory.com is the website for my paranormal the stuff. Stitcher, so I've got, like, iTunes. Yeah, That's you can yeah, yeah you can check out the podcast on everywhere. It's Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify. It's on all of them. Uh, iHeartRadio's got it. Um, all the major ones got it. Yeah, finally got on all of them. Yeah, yeah I don't think we're on iHeartRadio. That yeah, one takes a while. Yeah, that one will take you a few weeks. But now's the time to do it because they're really trying to to take over the podcasts. Yeah, they really want to be the place people go for podcasts. So I would go to our heart when you can. If you go to their website, you can find out how to submit and everything. Not to check. And it's real. You just give them your RSS feed, and, yeah, and they take yeah, care of the yeah. rest, um, just like all the others. But they take they do a real review. Like they they take like three or four weeks because they really review what you're doing. Yeah, you know. But um, but it's cool because you'll you'll find a lot more people that way. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for coming and talking to us. Thanks and, for having me. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, this was a great basement. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm in a brewery, and you guys didn't offer me a beer at all. I'm kind of uh, disappointed. Well, there's no. They don't have a drinking Jeez. license here. There's no so. drinking license here. Oh, it's because okay. it's a liquor store. Yeah, but we're in the basement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's going to find out? Yeah. Um, no, but thanks for coming to talk to us. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Let's and bring me back again, and I'll talk all about paranormal on another show. How's that? Just sounds perfect. How about cool. Halloween? We'll do that. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> Great, awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Uh, you can find us on all social medias at Inebriart, except for Instagram, we're at Inebriart6. You can email us with your questions, complaints, and whatnot at Inebriart at yahoo.com. And if you're looking for more podcasts, you can check out the other podcasts on our network, uh, Retro Redoctopus, uh, America's Hometown Horror, and, of course, Bar Talk, Old Colony, and Inebriart Podcast, the original Um, So check those out and subscribe and comment so we can reach more people. And thanks for listening.